Hello everybody, Happy New Year and welcome back to the channel. I think first of all, some apologies are in order. I had taken my own advice and uh, done more, albeit on the personal uh, side. I've spent the better part of the last two months travelling, uh, mainly through China and Tibet, and observationally at least, much of what we surmise to be the case in those parts of the world seems to be true. Which brings me to my next point, because during COVID I learned to edit video and I've decided to start another channel on YouTube, more for fun than anything else, and it's a lighter side, it's a lighter take on life, trying to document life in my 50s as it were. And I think some of the travels that I've done in China and Tibet and also in the past uh, are in some of the videos I've uploaded on that channel. If you want to check it out, uh, search for at Kusu Chuang on YouTube or um, click on the link which I'll leave down below. And which brings me to my next um, guest today with Professor Terence Gomez, a former professor of political economy at the University of Malaya, as well as its former dean at the economics faculty. Now, um, his resume is as impressive as his points of view, plural. I'll leave a link to his LinkedIn page down below if you want to check out where he's taught, what his um, areas of focus are, what his areas of research are. And so, have a look at that in your time. But for today's session, we focus on the political economy in Malaysia and the impact our politics and our policies have had on our livelihoods and our economy, which truthfully, in the last few decades, have provably been more bad than good. As always, if you find the conversations I have with my guests uh, on this channel, inspirational, educational, insightful, or all of the above, please do share them with your friends, your network, your contacts if you can. Uh, give me a like uh, on, the, on the video, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And so, without further ado, dear viewers, may I present Professor Terence Gomez. So Prof, um, thank you ever so much for doing this. Um, you know, ever since I spoke to you on radio, well, several times over the last few years, um, your work in this sphere, which you're about to discuss, is of huge importance to the country. Let me preface that discussion with the fact that at a global level, uh, the world has got lots of problems, right? At a structural basis, you've got climate change, you've got inequality, you've got high cost, inflation, if you like, uh, labor deficits, supply chain issues. But Malaysia has its own set of issues that it needs to grapple with and address with, in fact, quite immediately, lah. And I think this is one area that you've been looking at and studying for the last 30, 40 years, right? In your work in academia. Perhaps let's start with your views on where Malaysia needs to have the most work done at this point in time. All the issues that you mentioned can be brought under the framework of policies. And I like to go in that direction. We need to talk about the policies that were put in place that have brought us to where we are today. For that, we need to go into history. So let's take, for example, your point on inequality. In 1970, we had a major new policy called the New Economic Policy. It was a fundamental shift in the policy framework. It was a fundamental shift in the way the government intervened in the economy. And this allowed for the government to intervene to bring about changes in terms of how to address the serious problem of wealth and income dispar disparities and inter-ethnic inequalities. And if you look back at that period, it was the policies did good things. We can see the rise of a new middle class. We can see a strong emphasis on education, which created the manpower that fed into the economy. And if you look at the period running up to the early 1980s, it was a period when we saw a shift in wealth and income to among all ethnic groups. But there is another shift that we need to talk about. Again, we come back to policies dealing with the issues that you just raised. In 1981, globally, we saw a major shift occurring in terms of Britain, Margaret Thatcher comes to power, Ronald Reagan comes to power in the US, and there's a shift in the dialogue in terms of the role of the state. And here they talked about a different kind of system, a neoliberal system, where the private sector now runs things, not the state. The state should now retreat, let the private sector run things. Now we have to talk about that policy shift. Because if you want to talk about inequalities and supply chains and labor issues, they go back to that next defining moment. And in Malaysia, Mahathir, when he came to power, he was quite enamored by this paradigm shift. 
But Mahathir did something else. And that's where the Malaysian context is unique. Mahathir took the neoliberal ideas but retained the interventionist model. And that's something you don't see often in other countries. They either take this part or that part. And he mixed the two. And that brought about some of the major problems that we are seeing today, to my mind. What is the role of the state in the economy? What is the role of the private sector? How do we bring those two together in which we create a compact, and that was the ultimate aim, a compact between labor, state, and business? And if we have that compact, we can bring about greater equality because there's dialogue between all three. And that was a model, for example, we saw in Germany or we saw in Japan. In Germany and Japan, they were devastated by the Second World War. And they emerged very quickly to become the largest economies in the world, highly industrialized economies. And the way the economy is structured in those countries, for example, as opposed to Britain and the US, you will see that there is a compact between state, business, and labor. And that's the kind of compact we need even today, which we have forgotten. Because they do talk about PPPs, public-private partnerships. But remember, public-private partnerships. Where does labor fit into all this? Where do people fit into all this? And what of the role of the state? Today, because the way the state has intervened, it has brought about, it's led to other problems, cronyism, corruption, and so on and so forth. So people think state intervention is bad. Get rid of the state. But I would take a different view. I would think that the state should play a more dynamic role in terms of how to intervene in a way which is just, in a way in which we bring labor into the discussions, in the way in which we are fair to businesses too. And I want to end on this point, small and medium scale enterprises. When we talk about businesses, do we really think about SMEs? Or do we just talk about the big businesses? And we do, we think about foreign multinational companies and we talk about our big business groups, we talk about the GLCs. But 98.5% of Malaysia's corporate sector, 1.2 million companies, 98.5% of them are SMEs. A you know, forgotten group. You know, a senior banker friend of mine, Prof, uh, he said that in Malaysia, we've got at least three different economies, right? He said the smallest one, and I'm not sure whether he was being uh, facetious about this, he said the smallest one is the GLC economy. The second, well, the second, well, the number two economy in Malaysia, and this is a banker, he's very senior, so he knows what he's talking about, right? Because he funds the businesses, right? He says the second biggest economy in Malaysia is the SME economy. And then the biggest one of all, by a considerable margin, is the black market. Okay? Yes. So, so that's interesting, to, to me at least, right? But what you talked about, um, that you are um, postulating a, a, a more dynamic intervention of the state. Now that runs counter to what a lot of Malaysians think, because yeah. Malaysians seem to think that the civil service, the government, is too big, too uh, ponderous, and too omnipresent. You disagree, why? Let's go back to 1970. Okay. In 1970, we had all the problems here that you just mentioned at the outset, okay. specifically inequalities. There were serious issues that we had to redress. Did the government redress these issues? And I did say in the first 10 years, enormous changes happened because the way the state intervened. And this, at that time, the public delivery system will, was led by very able civil servants who knew how to conceive policies and implement them effectively. We had a policy direction which was very clear in terms of the goals that they wanted to achieve. And the primary goals were uh, redistribute wealth equitably and bring down poverty. And the direction in which they took was education. A strong emphasis on education. And they took poor children out of the kampongs, sent them to very good residential schools, and then sent them to universities, domestic and foreign universities. And from there emerged a new middle class, an independent, vibrant middle class. That was why that policy, was seen as, which was seen as a success story, was replicated or they tried to emulate it in South Africa, in Fiji. Are you telling me that when the state intervened that time and achieved all these goals, that they didn't achieve good things? That's why I said also, there was a shift. And the shift was from the role of the state where the outlook is what is good for society as a whole, and that includes labor and business, to a shift where the focus is on supporting business, 
with little discussion on society, the implications on society. So this brings us to your point. You talked about climate change, environmental damage. Is that coming from labor? Who is contributing to these problems? It's major enterprises. Complicit in all this is the state. So we must now look at the state business relationship and how it has evolved. That's one set of questions we have to discuss. The second question we have to discuss is, what exactly is the role of the state today? Is it as the same as it was in the 1970s? The third issue, what is the nature of the civil service and the public delivery system? Is it as efficient and dynamic, led by really competent people who know not only how to conceive policies, but also how to deliver them? These are the structural problems we need to change. So you rectify these problems, then you can go back to where we were, where our focus as a government leader, I would think my focus is the people. Ultimately, it's the people. But I do need economic growth. I do need businesses. But I have to be fair to all. And that's the role of the state, the mediation process between capital and labor. Are we doing that? I don't think we are doing that. I don't think the state is doing that. I think the component that is lost is really labor and society. The focus now is just about growth rates. GDP rates must be high. Then we are good. We have achieved something. But that's not good enough. It's not about GDP growth rates. It's about equity. It's about redistribution. It's about being fair to everyone. Is that happening when businesses take the lead? What is the primary motive of a business? And I don't blame them for it. They are in business to make money. Their primary motive is profits. And if they don't make money, then they can't survive. So you've got to be fair to them too. Let them do. If they're entrepreneurial and they can bring about uh, innovation and they contribute to development, why would we say no to that? But let's do it fairly too. So those are the issues that we need to talk about. Let me end on one point more. You talked about this banker who talked about the GLCs, the SMEs and the black market. Now here's the thing. You would know how much research has there been on SMEs? How much research has there been on the black market? Zero, if you ask me. Black market is absolutely zero. It's dark. <laughs> exactly. And, how, and yet, it's huge. That's the point. It's dark, but huge. And then there's the GLC. He says it's the smallest. They may be small, but how powerful are they? Just because they are small doesn't mean they have no power. They have enormous influence in the economy. So it's not about size. It's about presence, about the economic strength that they have to also intervene in the economy in a way which can be productive, which can also be in a way to help SMEs. Now, one of the roles of the GLCs was to bring about supply chains, connecting the SMEs with the GLCs, co connecting the SMEs with the MNCs. And the, the government again plays that role. And they had policies for that. They had a vendor development program. They had the industrial uh, linkages program. They had a global supply program to link the SMEs to the MNCs. And there were conditions under which MNCs could come to this country. You must be part of this vendor program so that we can create supply chains so that our SMEs can feed into the global economy. What happened to all that? Where are all these policies to make them more vibrant? Well, I think you and I know the role of politics and the contamination of political favour within the system. I, I think it was the venture capitalist Naval Rabikant, American guy. Like, he funded Facebook. He's very rich, but he's also yes. very... He's, he's reached a lot of conclusions in his life. And one of the things he said is that politics and politicians and the policies they foment are by nature inflationary because they drive up the cost of doing everything because their policies are not what's best for the country necessarily. Yeah. It's what's best for them at the party level, at yes. an individual level. So they will present policies for consideration by the country that gets them brownie points at a popularity level but it doesn't make the country any better it doesn't make it more competitive and that's the problem because those institutions that you talk about have been tainted by politics and and the yeah. policies of those politicians so what can change Chuan, let's let's be real eh? let's talk realistically when you go into politics you have your agenda you have your manifesto what is politics in the first place? Parties. Parties emerge to represent cleavages in societies. Society is full of cleavages, and that's why you have political parties. Political parties represent the different cleavages in society. 
and then they go out there and they try and get their support through their manifesto they're going to bring about these changes and then people vote for them they have to deliver on their manifestos but they don't do that do they now that's the problem what happens when they enter into the system now here we have to on one side we have politics and responding to this because remember politicians are in power only 4 or 5 years that they got to go back to the electorate so here we now come back to once they in power what do they do they conceive policies to respond to the needs of those who put them there now here we run into problems because we are now talking malaysian politics has been coalition politics too that's a fact we are multiracial society let's go back to the nature of policies broadly speaking our policies can be horizontal or vertical in nature horizontal means race based vertical means needs based we have shifted in 1970 when the state intervened we shifted and it was supposed to be short term race type policies now it was supposed to be short term 20 years but after 20 years the politicians decided no let's continue with this is popular right it gets the Among votes the majority it gets them the votes yeah. and that we have to go back and look at the large issues the gerrymandering and the malapportionment which also fit into this debate we have to think about those things but let's leave all that aside let's just talk policies policies of this sort and there's a big debate worldwide about whether policies should be race based or needs based even countries that were color blind as far as policies were concerned began to realize they have to look at such policies france is an example brazil is an example they were color blind and suddenly they said look actually we have to think about this again should we have at least for short term race based policies to rectify problems because these policies are embedded in racial divides too however we have to ask the question has malaysia reached a point where we have to change our policy direction the nature of policies and we have had this debate you know remember in 2008 we had a global financial crisis and when the global financial crisis occurred malaysia went into a recession malaysia also had a change of government when najib razak came to power and najib said we need a new economic model was he right yes he was right and interestingly enough in america obama comes to power and obama talks about hope and about creating a new model my point here is politicians embedded as they are in their political system also recognize that once they are in power you got to debate the nature of policies if you want the economy to survive if you want the economy to grow and here they had a defining moment where they talked about a new model my question is did they seize that opportunity to bring about a new economic model in the context of the new times that we were now in remember this is uh, 38 40 years after the new economic policy was well, implemented well that's the fundamental failure of democracy isn't it right because you will say things which seem to be favorable among people and then once you come in and but you only get elected once you have the support of multiple parties right then once and if you get into power you've got to pander to those multiple interest groups and that's why certain legislation that you propose yeah. or policies that you propose prior to elections they come into form in very diluted uh, in a very diluted diluted fashion and that's a big problem now right I, I, so i would suggest that democracy in its current form needs to be relooked at because as a result now you got people like Donald Trump you got people like um Marine Le Pen for example you got people like um Boris Johnson yes. you know and we've had people like like we've had in in Malaysia it is become troublesome because then the social policies which are supposed to be transient in nature they've become embedded in the social fabric and for us to now try and dismantle them has become anathema because it's like no you can't it's consecrated no no such thing but My question to you now is prof right if you have uh, if you're a father which I'm sure you are right and you've got the multiple children lah right usually the majority of the children will support the 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 you know the 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 minority of the children but in this country the minority of the children support the majority of the family how can that how can they be how can that stand the test of time in the long term now the two points I want to bring up first democracy the term is used very loosely loosely yeah we have to define what we mean by democracy including in the US and the UK mentioned Boris Johnson and mentioned Donald Trump 
Second, the nature of the discourses. Who defines the discourses, the public dis- discourses? And how does that shape the thinking of people on the ground? So let's talk with democracy first. Is it really a democracy when the people who fund the political system are private businesses? You mentioned Donald Trump. Mm. Look, who is Donald Trump? Boris Johnson, Conservative Party, enormous funding from private firms, which shapes, which shapes the nature of public policies, which shapes ultimately also the nature of their discourses that they propagate. Donald Trump is saying this, I'm coming here because government has failed us, I'm a businessman, I know how to run a company and make it big, follow my model. Conservative parties have been saying that since the 1980s. <coughs> you get the point. Now let's come to Malaysia too. Are we truly a democracy? Remember, we had single party rule until 2018. From the time of independence until 2018, we had single party rule, a single dominant party. 2018, again, let's talk, defining moments. It was a defining moment in 2018, and in 2018, they did talk about change. They did talk about changing the nature of public policies. If you look at their manifesto, they said, let's move away from race-based policies to needs-based policies. Let's truly democratize the system. Let's have political financing to even up the level playing, create a level playing field for politics. They talked about the media and, and freeing the media, talking about being more inclusive and letting people have a say in the nature of governance. All these are good things. It was one of the best manifestos I ever read. But what happened when they came to power? So here we have to look at the nature of the state. Who is in power? We have a new government. For the first time, democracy has come to Malaysia. But the new government is controlled by old elites. New state with old elites. The old leaders who actually contributed to the problems that we have today. And so now you see we have these problems in terms of trying to get old elites, the problem we're facing now, to get old elites who still remain in power to change the nature of public policies, to change the nature of discourses that we are having. Now, those are the issues also we need to grapple with. We have to put this in context. Now, I do feel, I honestly feel this, that we have a vibrant entrepreneurial base. I do feel that we have a vibrant middle class. I do feel that we have a student body in the universities that can be agents of change. Students have always been agents of change. Where we are failing is the quality of the education. We are not giving them the high quality education they need. And second, where we are failing them is the nature of the curriculum, which needs to be changed to equip them with the skill, skills of the modern economy. We can get things right, you know. Change the curriculum, change the way we teach, improve our tertiary and primary schools, bring high quality teachers into the system. We educate the young, my children, your children, in a way in which they are really equipped. And their thinking is widened, broadened, away from this state-directed discourses to thinking for themselves. You know, time and time again, Prof, I, I talk to people and they talk about the divide uh, between the elder, you know, the older generation and the younger generation. Younger generation, I mean, not surprisingly, lah, but they are willing to take on new ideas, to, um, to, 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 to think yes. about new paradigms, if you like. And, um, you know, we talk about the elites in Malaysia. These old guys, they've been around a long time, right? They don't yeah. seem to go away, you know? Yes. Um, it's going to take some time, right? Um, so, so when you talk about the, the issues that are facing Malaysia and you talk about how, you know, we, we need to change, right? Malaysia has been talked about in many, in many periods of the last 20 years as being a high potential nation. Oh, Malaysia can do this. Malaysia can do that. You know, you have the potential, your location, your education, your people. Blah, 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 blah. But we just stuck. To, we seem to be stuck in a period of lethargy, and it's been a long, long time. I, I don't know whether the the window for has changed from being high potential to has been has happened. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's like you know when it's like the tennis player Nick Kyrgios. You know, he, he's been talked about, for, oh, he's a high potential, he's so talented and all that. Yeah. Now he's 27 years old, people are like, has been really la, but past l- his prime, right? Lacks the discipline. <laughs> yeah. So Malaysia, right? Yes. Where do we go? We've got so much potential, but we have not even gone near exploiting yes. it. Yes. And why, the question we should ask is, why haven't we exploited these, this potential we know that exists? I just said it. We do have the potential. I said we have a vibrant entrepreneurial base. 
We are not exploiting them properly. I said that we have a vibrant middle class, very articulate, well educated. Multinational companies, when they talk to me, embassies, when they talk to me, they point to that, that we have an English speaking, well educated middle class that can fit into the kind of investments they want to bring in, which is a technology, high tech sector. That's where we are going into. Malaysia has to move in that direction. Unfortunately, it's English speaking. If people want to talk about it, I have no problems with the Malay language. I feel it's our national language. We should know a national language. But we cannot deny the importance of English. Do we have the skills and are we? Do we have the manpower? Yes. But there is a class divide there too. The middle class that had, had that opportunity to get good education because the middle class could take care of themselves now. They educated their children well, and they can fit into the modern economy as opposed to. The lower middle class and the poor, specifically the rural poor, who have been long marginalised. The education system has failed them. They are the ones who say now they have no hope. They are the ones who are also a major protest movement. They don't have language skills. Some people will say the um, policy has been to divide and conquer. That makes it easier because once you divide a body of people, it becomes easier to manipulate yes. them. Yes, do you agree with that? But who lost out in the end? We go back to 1970 when the new economic policy was introduced. It was helped the rural poor to help Bumiputras who were mired in poverty because of the injustices of colonial rule. Today, 50 over years since we introduced that policy, who are or which states are the poorest states, the least developed states in this country? Kedah, Kelantan, Sabah, Terengganu. Keda, these are all Bumiputra majority states. What happened to the policy which was targeted at them? Let's. I just want to finish this point. Yeah. The point is, when we have good policies, policies can be hijacked by politicians too to serve their own vested interests. Mm. That's why we have debates about rent seeking and cronyism. Yeah. The question is, why haven't we addressed that point about why is it that this policy, which was so good in the first ten years, It's not serving because the it's people in, in, anymore. Yeah. Because it's inconvenient, isn't it? Let, let's let's take a different. Because there's no political will to move in the right direction. Yeah, because it's conducive to stay in the status quo. That's right. Let, let's let's talk about um, other other sovereign sovereignties, right? Um, I want to talk about Bhutan because Bhutan to me is very interesting, yes. right? Costa Rica, for example, is another one, right? Bhutan has taken a tack where they don't measure the performance of the country by GDP necessarily. Yes. GDP is business based, it's trade based, right? It's all about money and cents and all these things, right? In Bhutan, they have a gross. They they measure by GNH, which yes. is gross national happiness. happiness yeah. Not once is there a reference to money or trade or business or economy. It's all about communal communism. Uh, communalism, communalism. Communalism. It's about education. It's about happiness. It's about welfare. It's about, it's about the environment. environment. All these things. So, if a country as small as Bhutan can adopt these principles, and they're not rich, are they? Quite yes. poor, you know. That's right. And they they don't mind staying the way they are because life is good, you know. You know. That's the point. Are we happy? I don't think we are. You know. I if mean, you, if you look at, let's just go down the road to Singapore, and you ask Singaporeans, Singaporeans are not known to be very happy people. The index on happiness, they don't rank very highly. Okay, so, and yet they are so highly industrialized. Yeah, and they're very wealthy, but they're miserable Precisely. sense of buggers. Precisely, <laughs> that is the point. The point is, are your citizens happy? Do they feel that the policies? Are done in a way in which it is just. Do they live in an environment where they have clean air, clean water? Do they live in an environment where they feel the transportation system is adequate? Well, strangely enough, Prof, you don't even mention it, right? Um, on Netflix is this new documentary called "Live to a Hundred." So I think they analyze four societies, right? There's one in Okinawa, there's one in Sardinia, there's one among the Mormons in, I mean, Loma Linda in California, yeah. And then one more society was in Singapore. Why? Because they got parks. It's it's it's, it's an artifice, but it's con- yes. designed around um, staying fit, exercise, you know, diet, a- active, transport, diet, and all these things, right? So Singaporeans. So I I think that there's something there. I mean, I I know what you're saying. But um, Malaysia doesn't seem to have this attention to detail in that respect. Uh, I just don't know whether, whether at a, at a at a at a conceptual level, rather than depend on the state to give us these things, whether they can emanate from the people themselves. Because you can choose to be the own agent of your change, right? Uh, not necessarily, because one issue which you didn't mention is health. 
the quality of health services and that's very very important you cannot depend on society to come up with the necessary health services that you require that has to be a public provision so the government has a important role in two primary areas education and health if the people are their well-being is to be seen to now let me ask you what is the quality of health services in this country what we have seen here is a problem of institutional decline public institutions have been in decline you mentioned it we've seen it in education we've seen it in the public delivery system and now let's talk health is the quality of health services in this country really very good i'm talking public health some people seem to say this lah some people seem to say the medicines that you get from a government hospital yes. are better than the hos- gov- um, private sector hospitals right now here's the difference on one hand we have a middle class which don't depend on the public health system we have our private hospitals and they also have their capacity to buy the medical insurance which adequately takes care of their health problems and they also are equipped to buy the necessary drugs they need to take care of themselves Yes, our public health system one good thing is that <coughs> one good thing about our public health system is that the best equipment to deal with issues like cancer, serious health problems are to be found in the public universities. If you go to a public university and thank God for this, it's cheap. You don't have to pay high fees. The best drugs can also be obtained there. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about health services also in terms of the quality of health care. I'm talking about the infrastructure and how well equipped is the infrastructure. Those are the important issues also you need to look at. I keep repeating this point. The middle class are more than capable of taking care of themselves. The Singaporean middle class can take care of themselves. As you said, they are rich. And when you're wealthy, I mean you're middle class, you know how to take care of yourself. But when you are not rich, when you are poor and you're so dependent on public services, then you run in a pro- run into a problem when you see a decline in public services and that's the problem we're dealing with today we're grappling with this point about the quality of healthcare we're talking about the quality of education we're talking about the quality of the bureaucracy and its ability to deliver policies you know we can come up with fantastic policies i every time i read the malaysia plan and all the other different policies i see it's so well written The question is can you deliver it and I give you one example the 9th Malaysia plan which Abdullah when he came to power Abdullah was a sea change compared to Mahathir after the long rule by Mahathir Abdullah comes in and he says I'm going to do things differently I think he had an 81% majority wasn't it at the time 2004 and 90 over percent 90 over percent in right. seats in parliament yeah uh and one of the second best in terms of public uh, support uh, during the election compared to the 1995 election where Mahathi surprisingly did better having said that the point is why did they support Abdullah because Abdullah said he's going to be a different kind of prime minister i'm going to be a prime minister for all malaysians i'm going to eradicate corruption i'm going to bring about important changes which he did look at the nine malaysia plan in terms of policy ideas look at the nine malaysia plan he shifted the focus mahathir's focus on creating was on creating big business groups conglomerates he shifted the focus to smes and he said that's where the focus should be mahathir's focus was on industrialization he shifted the focus to agriculture and he talked about bringing high tech into agriculture smart farming to improve agriculture why that would also help the poor farmers it will also help the rural folk the ideas were very good but he also said if you read the nine malaysia plan for all the good things that we are saying the last chapter of the ninth malaysia plan was on this point we must have a very good public delivery system abdullah failed because we do not have a very good public delivery system you can come up with all the best policies but if you cannot deliver this to the ground then what's the point you're going to be stuck in the middle as you just mentioned we are not solving the problems So that's where we have to focus on. We have to talk about really reform of the state. We have to talk about the nature of the bureaucracy because you mentioned Korea, you mentioned Japan. The best minds after they graduate from university, the best minds go into the public sector, Singapore, China. We, we used to have that, right? We used to have that. That was the way it was. Yeah. That was the way it, it was. It was a job of esteem and respect and That's uh, right. and merit and today we don't have that. When anymore. did it change? 
when we adopted these neoliberal ideas, when we started putting the focus on business, and suddenly civil servants were not getting the the recognition they deserved. Nobody wanted to join the civil service because the pay was so poor. We had an easy pono thing which just filled up the bureaucracy when we didn't need to have that kind of policy directives. Now, compare the salary schemes. If I'm a graduate with an economics degree from a good university, would I want to join the public sector or would I go to the private sector, to the MNCs in particular? Look at the salary difference between what you get in the private sector and what you get in the public sector. Now, look at whether this is the same situation in other countries which are highly industrialized. Just go down the road to Singapore. Go to Korea. Go to Japan. The graduates who go to the top universities go and join the public sector. You need the best minds in the public sector. The best minds are the ones who can conceive policies and respond to the problems on the ground. You know, but so they are not there. <laughs> <laughs> they are in the private sector making money for big businesses. And that's an injustice which is contributing to the inequalities that we see. And then once you read the apogee of the private sector, then you're able to lobby with your funds the people that you want to have in charge so then they can deliver the policies that are conducive to you at a business level and then the churn goes on, which is yes. why we've got these things happening, right? And let me right. ask you this. Who writes our public policies these days? It's consulting firms. Consulting <laughs> firms. Boston, McKinsey, That's Bain, right. all these guys. And they're paying Nobody a, a asked of money. the consulting firms to write their policies in the old days. The bureaucrats were on the ground. They could see when they delivered the policies on the ground, they could see the changes happening on the ground and they knew how to respond quickly to the changes, where to rectify and where to carry on. And what are the new policy directions to rectify actually problems? Do and consultancy yet, firms have this kind of... And, and yet, Prof, despite, I'm not saying because of, but despite all these issues that we talk about in Malaysia, right? I think our number, we are number two to Singapore in terms of GDP per capita, right? I mean, Malaysia isn't doing too bad. It isn't too, income levels, especially in the Klang Valley, are comparable with many parts of, de of de 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 the developed world, okay? Now, that's not to say there's inequality. there isn't inequality. There is huge inequality, right? The basic salary in, say, uh, Kota Baru is very different from the basic yes. salary in, in KL, in Chiras, for example, right? Or even Mon Kerala, let's just put it that way, right? Um, it seems insurmountable, these issues. It seems so insurmountable at a structural level because there is no will to do it. I'd even venture to say not even in the current government, despite what they say. Because what they say and what they do are two totally different things. So where does the change come from? No. Does the change come from the young? Does the change come from indivi at an individual level? No. I don't think we need to go there. Let's look at the structure of the economy. You mentioned growth and you only talked about Singapore. Malaysia and Singapore, the growth has been driven by foreign multinationals. We have an open economy, the investments come in and we grow. Let's look at Korea and Japan. When they grew, they put a lot of support on domestic enterprises. If you And they nurtured this from infant industries to becoming global leaders in their industries. Samsung, for example, Toyota. Now, that's the policy direction that they were talking about in the 1980s too. Nurturing domestic firms. That was supposed to be the focus. But where we ran into problems was we didn't look for the best entrepreneurial capacity. In fact, we had a problem of ethnic bypass, which was a term widely used. We bypassed the most entrepreneurial companies because of another kind of policy agenda. This is the problem with mix and match policies. When you have mix and match policies, then suddenly the outcomes turn out differently. But we had it right. We were talking about nurturing domestic firms. We went into Proton Soga because we wanted to develop a car industry which will have supply chains where the SMEs will supply to Proton and then we create a really vibrant base. That happened in Korea. Hyundai and Proton were around the same time. Look at Hyundai today and look at Proton. What happened to the supply chains that were supposed to come in to feed into creating a dynamic entrepreneurial SME base? I mean, and are you telling me that we didn't have it at that time? We had many companies which were involved in the car sector and into spare parts and all these kind of things, but they were not from the right ethnic group. They wanted to create a new type of entrepreneurial community. And that's where we seem to have failed, the bypassing of really entrepreneurial, really good entrepreneurial capacity. So this comes back to your question to me, where do we start? 
I say to you, Chuan, we have it on the ground. There are still companies there which are highly entrepreneurial. If you look at the top companies in the country, publicly listed alone, the top companies, apart from the GLCs, there are really some very highly entrepreneurial companies, including in manufacturing. Are you telling me that we can't develop this base, especially at the SME level, among the medium-scale enterprises in particular? The lever would be to eradicate any form of... Um, um, okay, let's just put it another way. The key to doing that would be to introduce a completely merit-based system, which is not politically conducive, but it is competitively conducive for the country. Yes. Now, when you look at the profile of some of the biggest new companies in the last 10 years, they, are, they have happened in spite of the policies, not because of the policies. Companies like Yinsen, Farm Fresh, Kasem. Yes, you know, that's right. Um, Vitrox. Which example, proves my point. They're all owned by the Jina Pet, right? Yeah. So the, the, the problem is, it's not conducive to support these people because it's, that's the lay of the land. So I, I don't want to get into that whole discussion, no. right? Um, but what would really trigger the, the needle change is for a government that is entirely merit-based. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think MDEC is pretty good in that respect. But it's not, it's not a broad brush around I have to I have to correct you on this because I think the way in which you're making the argument to my mind may be slightly flawed. Here's the point. First, the companies that you mentioned have done it in spite of the problems. Yes, in spite, in spite of the problems. They yes. chose you entre real entrepreneur yeah, capacity. Yeah, yeah. Second, I said to you that we created a vibrant Bumiputra middle class. Many of them are in business. Very well equipped. I've had many Bumiputra businessmen coming and telling me, we have a policy to support Bumiputras, but we are not getting it. Here we go into the problem of the nature of the state and the concept of selective patronage. Are the most equipped Bumiputras getting the rents created for the state? Based on merit too. They are well equipped. They themselves are complaining about it. Take the LCS scandal. If you read the LCS scandal, which is about shipbuilding, where they wanted to bring in suppliers into this. Sorry, not shipbuilding. Let's talk about the Jana Vibawa scandal. That recently, the Bumiputra Association, Businessmen's Association said, we know what the policy is about. It was supposed to help us. But we know how the system works and we were not getting access to these concessions that were being created by the government. I am saying to you that even very vibrant, well-equipped businessmen, Bumiputras, who can contribute to this and can compete, are also being bypassed. That is the problem in the country today. Well, I would even go higher than that because concessions by nature are very lucrative because they are monopolistic in nature, right? Um, so why in the first place should we have concessions? And Malaysia is... A, I, I agree with that too. Mal Malaysia is a country of monopolies, right? Yeah. We've got a monopoly on, on rice production, yeah. on defence, on um, uh, electricity generation, yeah. um, sorry, electricity distribution, right? Um, pay, pay televisions, for example, right? So, so many defence... Um, I mean, so many, right? Uh, in the, the point, military, right? The, the point uh, here... Telecommunications. The point here is we are talking about different... 5G. <laughs> we are talking about different segments of the corporate sector. I was talking about policies to help SMEs. Correct. So that's why people now talk about the GLCs are, out, are crowding out the SMEs, leaving them no room to wiggle, so they've got to go out. And that's why you see a lot of companies that are listing abroad. They're listing in America, they're listing in Australia, they're listing in yes. Singapore... They're listing anywhere else but Taiwan. Taiwan has got a few Malaysian companies that have set up shop there because at home it's just... So let's not stuck, like get stuck in the minutia of the current era, right? What you propose is a, is a sea change among government to say, let's go back to the 80s where we fund the private sector, fund the SMEs, right? Let's remove any reference to, you know, um, um, political affinity, for example, and move towards merit-based. And let's do it that way because the SMEs are 98% of the economy. Let's do it that way. Is that what you're saying? I am saying that entrepreneurial capacity, if you really want to develop it, you've got to nurture it. You've got to support it. The government actually does have a policy on that. But they also, and they have a lot of funding for it, but they also stop at a certain point. Once they reach a certain point, they say, okay, enough is enough. We now must support other companies to come up. But they're at the point when they're ready to take off and then suddenly they can't take off because they're not getting adequate funding. What's the problem there? 
funding for R&D, research and development. If you want to move up, you have to invest in research and development at companies, especially in things like technology, for example, in manufacturing. That's expensive. And that is something the state must also support. The problem with the state is when they are supporting companies, as I said, they don't do it to the point where they really have taken off. I went to visit companies in Klantan, in Trunganu. I visited the small-scale enterprises, and they, they looked very entrepreneurial to me. And they were in a sector which we needed their support, food security, even agriculture, even food production, poultry. And I looked at them and I asked them, why are your companies, they're not doing as well as I thought. They said, just when we are ready to really take off, we are building the supply chains, we want to go into greater production, we can't. And I said, why? Because they cut off the funding now. They're not giving us enough support to move up, to invest more in technology, to invest more in plant and equipment. Second, they talked about land. It's very hard to get access to land. I'm a very good farmer. My land is very productive. My neighbor is not productive. But I can't expand because of land problems. And third, they said, marketing. I want to get my products to the market. Who is supposed to help me? Pharma. They have GLCs, as you call them. I call them public institutions, statutory bodies, created to help specifically these people. I don't want to talk about companies. Or everyone is classified as GLCs. I don't want to talk about companies. I want to talk about public institutions, statutory bodies, where in the 1970s, in fact, they created these in the 1970s to help develop a thriving agriculture base, which they did. And they had a different system, cooperatives, Felda, Felcra, they're cooperatives. And then they go and corporatize them and take away the power from the people and put it in the hands of board of directors who are political appointments. So the people lose their say. Cooperatives where people have a say in how to develop the land. These kinds of the things, I, if you ask me, I would like to focus my... Those are the things I would like to go back to. Those things that worked, which allowed for businesses to emerge. Those things which allowed for production to increase. And I'll ask the question, where did we go wrong? When did the tide change? What were the policy changes that brought about what was good and go into a downturn? And I think that's what we should be doing today. History is an important teacher, you know. History are, tells us where we, where we did right and where we went wrong. What are the three things we can do to make that happen? Well, first of all, let me be very clear. I'm not an opponent of the GLC system. I would, in you fact... You sound like you're actually an advocate, but it has to be re-looked at. That's right. I was just coming to that point. I would redefine what we mean by GLCs. GLCs, we immediately think, by the very nature of this term, government-linked companies. GLCs are much more than that. They are public institutions. They are statutory bodies. I mentioned Falca and Fal Falda and Falcra. We have Kasida and Katanga. These are institutions planted in the rural areas to aid rural communities, which did very well. They help reduce poverty in rural areas. That's a fact. I'm talking about those institutions. For the multitude of companies which have been set up, I'll say close them down. We don't need them. And do you know how much cost savings we will have from that? But that's problematic because what about the people who employed them? If you think this carefully. So I'll get rid of many of these small companies which are basically not doing nothing. And as you said, possibly even crowding out really entrepreneurial firms. In fact, when I was in Klantan, they were telling me they were trying to come up SMEs. But they had a problem because Kasada or Katanga, one of these institutions, had set up a GLC to, and they were competing with them. So I asked these people in Kasada, why, why are you setting up a GLC? And then they said, because the government wants us to be self-sufficient and earn our own money. I said, that's not your role. The government should be funding you. And you shouldn't be going and looking for money and creating companies and then competing with the people you're supposed to be helping. I said, this is nonsensical. We have reached a point where the whole system has gone all right. There's no method to what's going on. It's complete madness on the ground. It's just huge. Reform that system, clean it up, make it slim, and be very clear what these different institutions are supposed to do. So that's number one. That's number two? Then the policies come in. Now that you have these institutions which have all been cleaned up, what are the policies we need to put in place where we use these institutions which are already well-placed and deeply embedded in the areas that we need them 
to be- increase productivity. Number three, the funding. Where is the money going to come from for all this? Those are important things we got to think about. Because it's true, you can't depend on the government for all the funds. The government also has to think about funding and where is funding going to come from. So that's another debate. Huh? But where is the fund going to come from? Then we can go into taxation and all these kind of things. But I'll leave that aside. My concern is inequalities, as you mentioned. Inequalities. My concern is food security. My concern is the well-being of the young people and their loss of hope in the rural areas which I've seen. My concern is for young people also who recognize that they know how to till the land, how to use, they grew up on it and cannot get engaged in that because there's no money in it. Why would they tell me, when I saw them, they told me there's no money in it. We got to make money to survive. And the government is not really helping us, even though the institutions are there. And there are structural problems that are preventing us from doing this. And I'm asking myself, why is the government in all this? Where is their focus? And I'm not talking federal. Eh? I'm also talking state governments. I'm talking about the state governments too. Where is the state government in all this? And this brings us to the other issue which we have to talk about. The bureaucratic system, coordination between ministries and between federal and state. In the old days, we had EPU and EPU connected the federal to the states. There was a body that connected federal and state institutions so that they work in tandem to deliver things on the ground. So it's not state policies come or institutions doing one thing and federal doing another thing and then they clash, which is exactly what's happening today. There was a coordination that was going on so that you can effectively deliver the policies on the ground. Is that in place today? And today we have a real problem because we have 13 states and we've got probably about six, seven parties, different parties in the states and not all of them belong to the ruling coalition. Problems in coordination. But what about the federal system itself? How many ministries are there? I think 35 or something. <laughs> no, about 26. Is it 26? 25, 26. Yeah. Do we need so many ministries? I think we all know the answer how to that, right? many, How much coordination are, is there between these ministries? Are they duplicating things? Yes, take the famous example, Tibet. How many institutions are doing Tibet? And they all belong to different ministries. How many ministries are imp- responsible for rural industries? How many ministries are responsible for SMEs? Are they talking to each other? Are they coordinating? I think we know the answer to that as well. And that is the problem. And that is the point. Chuan, if we know th- the problem, we know the answer to that, why aren't we addressing the problem? And what's your, what's your best, ca- what's your best uh, answer? No, unfortunately, when we talk about policies, we have to get back into politics, the nature of politics. And when you have coalition politics, you've got to accommodate. That's a problem about coalition politics. You've got to accommodate the different parties. And how do you do that? You give them cabinet positions. Yeah. And then suddenly you create too many yeah. cabinet positions. And then positions. you got inertia, right, as a result. And th- then you have a problem. Yeah. Because when you have a m- minister in charge of ministry, it becomes his fiefdom. So then, do we come? Do, do we go back to the? I mean, two extreme examples are China and India, right? Chi- China is this overbearing one party that is so powerful, right? But they get stuff done. Okay. Then you got India on the other hand, who is who is a complete democracy. It's a bloody mess, right? Um, Malaysia somewhere in between. Do we co- go back to an era where you've got a very very strong, almost totalitarian government, but really has its heart in the right place, and then get stuff done? Rather than what we've come, what, where we are now, which is very fragmented, very co- very um, fra- very di- different opinions and different, very cl- reflecting the many cleavages in society. I would like to not worry too much about the heart and where the heart is, but I would like to talk about the structure in place in these two countries. India and China are rapidly emerging. India was, they were, in fact, India we thought at one point at the turn of the century will do better than I think they're the most populated well the most populous country in the world now because China's got this huge um, birth rate issue right Yeah, and it's aging fast so that's a big big structural problem for them yeah but let's come back to the big issue here which country is going to be the largest economy in the world very soon it's China and look at China's economic system and compare it with the current largest economy in the world which is the United States which is falling rapidly now, what is it that's also drivers of growth in China in terms of how China is emerging so quickly? Specifically, you know, it's policy, to, isn't it? It comes up, but also the institutions to implement policies. 
And it's because it's driven by this all-powerful, all-seeing force from above, which just says, let's get stuff done. And they, they get stuff and done. And the institutions that they have are state-owned enterprises, mm. which are both industrial and financial. The financial-industrial linkage is very important and well-coordinated. They have a larger policy called the Belt Road Initiative, which is also not just domestic, but regional. They know now that you can't just look internally. Let's go regional. And which institutions are they looking to to help them do these things? State-owned enterprises. And their state-owned enterprises have become global. If you look at Forbes, the top five companies in the world, three of them are SOEs from China. Yeah. Let's talk about the thriving economies over the past years that we have seen. The BRICS. Brazil, India, China, Russia, South Africa. All of them have one thing in common. Indonesia too. SOEs. And SOEs are major drivers of growth. State-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises. GLCs we call them like, GLCs. Oh. Actually, we are the only... Malaysia and Singapore are the only two countries in the world that uses the term GLCs. All other countries in the world use the term SOEs. Now, this comes back to my point too. We don't talk enough. I just said earlier, how much do people know about GLCs? How far that matter? SOEs. Remember? Earlier, we just talked about it. There's so little education, even in the universities. You're here in the Asian school. School of Business, do they have any courses on SOEs? Do they teach the students about this new phenomenon called SOEs, which we find in all the major countries in the world which are thriving? Zero knowledge being imparted to the young. And yet, structurally, they are the drivers of growth. And here we are talking about the state being, a, you know, we should do something about the state and take them out. Where is Britain today? Look at Britain's economy. Where is the US today? And yet, the state-driven enterprises are the ones, the countries with state, with SOEs, are the ones which are thriving. That says a lot. Why? There's a strong coordination between policies and the institutions to deliver them. The state is also directed by people who have a vision of where they want to go. It may not necessarily be good can be bad too, huh? depending who's the leader, as we know. The problem here is, are the SOEs effective? Compare them to ours. Are they effective? Are they doing the policies that they were mandated to do? Is there that financial, industrial, agricultural links that we are talking about to bring about that kind of growth that we are talking about? I forgot to mention Vietnam. Now we are saying Vietnam is doing better than Malaysia. Vietnam is an SOE-driven economy. I was in Vietnam last month. I was looking around. Agriculture, thriving. Industrial base, thriving. They also still bring in a lot of foreign direct investments. Korea has got a big presence there. But I still see the role of SOE is also playing a big role in helping to drive these key sectors. Now, we have that infrastructure. We have those institutions in place. All we need is to have the right policies to use those institutions within that architecture, infrastructure that we have created, which once served us well, in a proper manner, targeting the people who really need help. And in the process, we will help the poor. We don't need to racialize the policies if it's based even just on targeting where the needs are and the right sectors, we will have that growth. If we bring in the right kind of SMEs into the system and become part of the global supply chain, it will work. Remember, if you want to be part of the global supply chain, you better produce products which are high quality if not they get kicked out of the supply chain, right? And today, nobody talks about sectors anymore. They talk about supply chains. They talk about getting into supply chains because nobody's talking about domestic economy. And it's about being part of the global supply chain. You just build this component, but high quality. And when they upgrade, you also upgrade simultaneously. For that, you still need state support. You know, as I said, R&D funding and so on and so forth. Here's the thing. Read the 12th Malaysia plan. Read the 11th Malaysia plan. Especially Same thing. <laughs> it's all there. It's there. They just did a copy-paste. In fact, next yeah. week, next week, they're going to debate the midterm review of the 12th Malaysia plan. I was looking at the 12th Malaysia plan even before I came for this, and I was thinking, it's there. They're talking about these things. And the overriding team was about a family, a Malaysian family, Kluaga, Malaysia, 
the rhetoric is there the ideas are there as you said it's always in terms of the delivery and in fact if we get reform the institutions properly they are already in place we can deliver these policies as mandated in the 12 Malaysia plan too it seems so easy to say doesn't it prof you know darrens <laughs> <laughs> no i mean actually in practice if you just want to you just switch on you just do right if you if you're in china for example that fellow from above what's his name xi jinping is this hey bugger go and do within 2 months is done right yeah. hey i want this high speed uh, rail road from a to b 400 kilometers done right because you got this one man flat at the top yeah um we don't have that in malaysia Chuan, it's taken us so I long i agree it's not easy again i'm speaking at the level of what we can do i'm speaking at the level of ideas which is what we are supposed to be discussing correct, correct. now comes to the realities of getting it done if you want to close down this multitude of companies what Painful. are the what are the implications of that it's not easy mm. if, you, if you want to talk about reforming the statutory bodies so that they can and equip to the right people who can deliver the policies is it so simple that we can just go and find people out there come and take it over and run it if we want to talk about our publicly listed glcs which are in the top 10 and want to go regional if not global Is it so easy to go and find the right people, really the right people, and put them there to drive it? Who would want to do it? If I'm a very good professional, I know how to run a company. I'm not talking about ownership. I'm talking about a manager. Well, I think MAS and an experiment, right? Twice. <laughs> I would think to myself, why do I want to go and sit in the GLC where I'm yeah. exposed to the public and I'll be criticized for everything I'm doing when I can yeah. work quietly in a multinational company? Have your life threatened in some cases? Precisely. It's not simple. The problems we are confronted with, we know what to do, as you said, but getting it done is not simple, and that's where the political will comes in. We have to make difficult decisions, and we have to be for the short while. There will be some suffering, but these things have to be done. But in the long term, if we do it right, we solve a lot of problems. The last time we tried to do this was, I think, roughly five years ago, and then that splintered within a year and a half. I mean, the road to redemption is can be painful, and in fact, it is painful, and it's also long. We try to get on that in two thousand eighteen. Yes, fail, right? Fail. It just went bush. I wouldn't say it failed. I would say they didn't have enough time to bring about because of the coup that happened, the change, yeah. the Sheraton. Yes, move. because it's so painful that a huge body of people says, "Let's not do that. Let's go back to the old ways." Again, I want to come back to the point. Did they really? think this true in terms of how do you get it implemented properly for example let's talk ministries now we have to get back into the nature of the state the nature of the state they were unified in the run up to the election and they won unexpectedly they won that that election nobody expected the opposition to win the 2018 election they won now they had to govern now they are in power now the question here is this are they on the same page Mahathi himself said, "Manifesto is one thing. I don't necessarily need to subscribe to the manifesto. Second, in terms of cabinet ministries, for what reason did he go and create a ministry of economic affairs when we already have enough? Creating another ministry which is not required, when you already have finance ministry, you have ministry for rural development, which are all basically doing similar things. So these things interfered." with the implementation of a very well thought out manifesto to try and solve these problems as you said it was difficult and when there's difficulty there will be protest from the ground normal we must expect that and there was but how do you react to these problems how do you convince these people in the long run that there is a long term agenda which in the ultimately will pan out well meanwhile you cannot marginalize or Put aside the needs of the poor. You got to think through your changes. That's why I say, said it's easy to talk about these things, but implementing it, huh? You got to think through. You know, some months ago I spoke to Idris Jala, right? That was three Idris Jala, Idris Jala, and I felt that he was really the leader that Malaysia could have had, but but didn't get right for for the reasons stated above, lah. Okay, but the thing is, for him, because he's a change agent, he does it at the corporate level, right? And he says that to get difficult things done. 
it's like small new uh, bad news and small doses. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, I know. You, you don't just go and boom. That's right. That, right. You just don't go and destroy everything. It's just small, small bits of I bad agree. news, and then over time things change. I Which agree. I agree with you. That 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 implementation was not well thought out, nor was it well executed. As you said, it was like a big bang thing. Yeah. I don't subscribe to the view of the big bang mm. because ultimately the people who were really f- feeling more hard done by were the poor. Yeah. They took away the subsidies, for example, mm. in rural areas. You can't do that. You cannot simply just take away the subsidies. I know subsidies can be a waste. It's not going to the right people and all that. All that I accept. But I'll revisit how it's being implemented rather than just clean the slate, wipe it off the slate. Of course, there'll be a lot of cost savings and we get rid of the so-called leakages. Fine. But in the process, when you did that, you also left poor people further behind. No, you can't do that. You've got to think these things through and how you're going to implement these things. So it seems to me there is a recipe for implementation now because the mistakes have been made in the past, right? Now, with this new government or maybe the one after that or two or three from now, there's a template to follow, right? Don't do it like that in the past because it's screwed up. Let's do it this way in the, in, in the future. The question is, do we have enough time though? The question is, should we do it or not? I think so. Yes. Of course. So why does the time factor come up then? Are you saying we are going to carry on in this system which is getting us nowhere? The middle class is becoming the new poor. The young have no hope because the education system is in the doghouse. We have to start somewhere. There will be some pain along the way. But we jolly well better start now because we are really in the doghouse now. How old are your children, Prof? My my daughter is 32 and my son is 30. <laughs> and I've got another son who's 22. Okay, so they are the ones, right? Yes. Yeah, they are the ones in the next generation, right? Yes. How they behave, what decisions they make in the wake of where the country is and other of their peers, right, at that age group and maybe even one generation before, where do you think they are in terms of their thinking about Malaysia? You see, interesting. that's an interesting point because, in fact, I was talking with my wife too about this issue in terms of where our children are going, their future. We are very worried. Where, what's the future for our children? They're well-educated. They've got good education. They can take care of themselves. My daughter works for an NGO on gender issues. She's very troubled by all the debates that's going on here, you know, on the gender-based discourses which seem to further marginalize women the minorities, LGBT issues, and so on and so forth. And she's really worried, even with the current government and the way the direction we're going. Can I wear watch anymore, by the way? That's the point. <laughs> it's so, it is so idiotic. Yeah. It just makes no sense. No sense. I have another son. My son is a lawyer. He's okay. He likes what he's doing. He's a professional. He's not worried about his future because he's a professional. It's and exportable, la, that skill. He can work anywhere in the world. Mm. He knows that too. He's even thinking now of going and doing a further degree, uh, LLM, so that he can expand his horizons. Good for him. He's not worried as much about what is happening in the country because he knows if this really goes bad, he knows he has options. How many young people have the options that my children have? That they can go somewhere else if they wish? that they can change jobs at will. You know, young people who are well-educated change jobs very often. I'm not worried about the middle class, John. I really am not. They can take care of themselves, even the young middle class. And they have options. I am worried about those who do not have these options. I'm worried, and come back to your first point to me about inequalities, about those who have been left behind. How can they catch up? How do we help them? How do we give them hope? That should be the focus of our policies, to give the young hope, to give them direction, give them jobs which they're equipped to. How do we give them jobs when they're not equipped for it because they don't have the education training, educational training for it? We are really in a very bad shape. And I'm here talking about those who have been left behind. I'm not talking about the middle class, as I said. The middle class can still survive. Where is the policy direction to really help them? Do you see any new policies coming out focusing, say, on agriculture? Where agriculture is the real target group. When food security is our big problem, too. Where it happens to be in the poorer states, too, where agriculture is located. Yeah. And this Mahate is 
move from industrialization where he forgot the agriculture sector. He forgot in that sense the rural poor. How do we go back? And now they are an important asset to us. They have the know-how to develop the agriculture sector, to help deal with the food security problem that we are facing. Well, I, where are the policies on that? Simple thing, targeting also the right areas. So I'm not even seeing that too. And these are the things which I'd like to do, put on the table for the policy people also to think about. Well, I think the whole point from this discussion today, Prof, is that I, I don't think we're going to see see change happen overnight, nor will we see you know, transformational restructuring happen in the space of a few days. It's going to take no. years and years, maybe even generations. But the fact that we're having this conversation today, okay, um, will put out hopefully into the, into the universe um, the possibility for change. And I think that's the, that's the most we can hope for. That, I think, is the real power of conversation, yes. which I think hopefully will emanate from this discussion that we're having today. Yes. I think we put forward a lot of good thoughts. I think we have tried to put forward some sort of constructivity to, to what are quite systemic problems in Malaysia. And I hope that if one person listens to this conversation and thinks to themselves, I can be that agent of change. And that person, whether you call him Barack Obama or whether you call him John F. Kennedy or even the Mahatma Gandhis of the past, right? If one person emanates from this discussion, I think we've done our job. Oh, don't forget Mandela. <laughs> Nelson Mandela, exactly. Yeah. 25, how many years yes. of incarceration? And the structural features of South Africa Correct. and Malaysia are very similar. Very similar, very similar. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughts. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.